Hello, welcome to this webinar uh, hosted by the Wilberforce Institute. I'm Dr Nick Evans, one of the lecturers at the Universities of Hull's Wilberforce Institute, and today we're delighted to welcome you to a webinar on modern slavery in the Humberside area. Uh, this uh, webinar is part of the Freedom Festival 2020, and we're delighted that you'll be able to join us for this online activity. Today we're delighted to be able to uh, uh, present or have present to you to uh, authorities in our region on modern slavery or contemporary slavery, um, Alicia Kidd and Andrew Smith. Uh, Andrew Smith is chair of the Humber Modern Slavery Partnership and is at the forefront in an organization at the forefront in fighting slavery in the Humberside area. He's joined by his co-chair, uh, Dr. Alicia Kidd, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Hull's Wilberforce Institute but also co-organizer of a great partnership between many organizations in our region that are in, involved in trying to stop or mitigate the effects of contemporary slavery. So without further ado, uh, we're delighted to be able to hand over to these uh, great experts in, in this uh, pressing issue in human rights in our area. So over to Alicia and Andrew, welcome. Thanks very much. Um, so. We're very pleased to be able to be here to present to you today about modern slavery in the Humberside area. And first of all, um, I've got to start by commenting about why we use the term Humberside, because obviously it's not a term that's, that's really used in our area anymore. Um, but we use the term because the area that we're covering is the Humberside Police area. So it covers the four local authority areas of Hull, East Riding, North Lincolnshire and North East Lincolnshire. So just to begin with, we'll do a little bit of an introduction. So, Andrew, do you want to, to spend a couple of minutes talking about your role on modern slavery in our area? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's lovely to be here and I hope it's informative for everybody. So my role as the coordinator of the Humber Modern Slavery Partnership really is to try and bring our four local authority areas together. Uh, in our response to modern-day slavery and human trafficking, whether that's local authorities, uh, Humberside Police, our statutory and non-statutory partners, in really focused effort across the region to make sure that we disrupt organised crime groups, um, we tackle those that would look to exploit our vulnerable, and also that we're in a good position to be able to support victims um, or potential victims as well. So through those vulnerable cohorts, maybe people seeking asylum, maybe homeless people, um, families, young men and women living in abject poverty, all those type of people that may be at risk, uh, we try and our aim is to coordinate that response in, um, in assisting them to uh, be free of exploitation. Thank you. So I work very closely with Andrew in my role as Vice Chair of the Humber Modern Slavery Partnership. Um, and we will talk to you a little bit more later on about what that partnership is and um, what the response is in our area. Um, but I'm also employed by the Wilberforce Institute, which is part of the University of Hull. And there I'm a postdoctoral researcher. So my research looks at um, a wide range of different topics all relating to modern slavery. So I'm particularly interested in um, ideas of agency and how someone's environment can impact the likelihood that they could become a victim of, of modern slavery. So now you know about us, we'll talk to you a little bit about what modern slavery is, what we're talking about when we're using this term. Um, so I think over the past few years, there's been a definite increase in people's awareness of this term of modern slavery. Uh, but also a bit of confusion because there are so many different terms related to it that, that vary slightly and we're not sure of the differences. So since 2015, um, the, the government in that year brought in the uh, Modern Slavery Act. And that act uses modern slavery as an umbrella term. And within that, you've got uh, human trafficking and slavery, servitude, forced and compulsory labour. And there is a slight difference between the two. So um, the easiest way, I think, to, to describe these two different types of experiences is by using this um, idea of the act, the means and the purpose. So to prove a situation of human trafficking has occurred, you need to show that 
there has been the act and the act refers to what is done so that's the recruitment transportation transfer harboring or receipt of a person um, and that could be across a border it could be someone being moved from another country into the uk from the uk out to another country but it doesn't have to be cross-border uh, transportation it could be within the uk um, so, so you don't have to cross a border to be able to fit the definition of being a victim of human trafficking. The second part of the definition is the means, and that refers to how how this thing happens. Um, and this is often done in a real variety of ways. Um, so we're looking at things like threats or coercion. Uh, we often see deception where somebody is told what the situation is going to be, that they'll get a job x amount of hours in x location and they'll get paid x amount of money um, but when when they arrive in the destination they discover that they're actually working far more hours than they were they agreed to they're working in a completely different uh, region or a completely different type of labor um, and uh, the, the pay isn't what they were expecting um, fraud or an abuse of a position of vulnerability. And again, this is something we see quite a lot. So where somebody um, is accepting or willing to um, move or take up work or um, work for somebody else because what they're offering them is better than the situation they're in. And this comes back to my interest of issues of agency where in some cases of modern slavery where people are um, offering a situation that is better than the, the situation that the person is currently in they're in a really difficult position especially if they know that there might be a risk of exploitation to know whether it's worth taking that risk or not and a lot of my research in modern slavery uh, argues that um, there is some degree of agency when people are making decisions around something that may end up leading to exploitation but for many of them they're having to make decisions between two really bad options um, so a lot of my work is looking at conflict and if someone has the opportunity to leave a situation where their life is at risk and they they don't know how long they're going to be able to survive in that area and someone offers them an opportunity to leave the area um, and they're not sure how legitimate this offer is it's a case of weighing up that balance of, of whether it's worth taking the risk or not and then finally, we've got the purpose, which is the form of exploitation that somebody will be put into. And we'll go on to talk about the different types of exploitation in a minute. But just to clarify that difference there between um, what human trafficking is and what slavery, servitude, forced and compulsory labour is. Uh, human trafficking, you have to prove the act, the means and the purpose. Whereas for slavery, servitude and forced and compulsory labour, you don't need to prove the act. So you don't need to show that movement in persons. Uh, and what's really interesting to note here is that for children you don't need to prove the means so really when we're talking about modern slavery in children you only need to prove that purpose so the definition of modern slavery for children is really very broad so moving on, on to those those different types of exploitation um, we've got five main types that we, we we talk about in the uk so first off is labor exploitation and this can be any kind of labour. We tend to see it most often in low paid and low skilled labour, um, but it, ca it can be anything. So things that we see most often could be things like um, agriculture, food processing, um, shellfish gathering, um, uh, takeaway, um, leaflet delivery. You often hear about car washes and nail salons in the media and they are areas that it happens, but it is important to emphasise that those aren't the only areas that it happens. I don't know if you want to jump in here, Andrew, to talk a little bit about the difference between forced labour and bonded labour. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there is a little bit of difference between forced labour and bonded labour. Uh, typically within the UK, we see the difference generally um, bonded labour quite often tends to be attached to some form of trafficking. So if I take trafficking from overseas as an example, um, those that may wish to come to the UK for a promise of a better life, maybe employment, security, safety, accommodation, etc. Quite often the, the tactic, um, the means used by exploiters um will be to offer a job will be to offer accommodation 
um, to be to offer the transport, but there will be a cost attached to that. And the agreement will be that the individual or individuals will repay that debt um, by their labour when they get to the UK, for example, um, and then they will pay back that money for the transport, etc., for the accommodation. Uh, unfortunately, what happens um, in most cases is that that debt is never paid off. It's quite often a, an extortionate amount of money. Um, the victim doesn't understand how much money it is. Um, and the way the exploiters work it, very often that debt is, is just huge and is just never repaid. Um, forced labour, certainly, again, in the UK, slightly different in the respect that uh, the bonded element doesn't tend to be there. Um, so when we talk about forced labour, we tend, again, to see more people in a situation of um, extreme desperation, extreme abject poverty. So an example we could use could be homeless people or rough sleepers. They will tend more often to be exploited for forced labour. They will be tricked in a similar method. They will be told they'll be given accommodation, et cetera, et cetera. But when they actually reach that destination, when they actually arrive at that um, place of employment or that place of exploitation, they are just uh, completely held captive and are forced into labour and it's really, really difficult to get out of. So I think that's explained it well enough. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So then moving on to the different types of exploitation, um, criminal exploitation is another thing that we're starting to see more and more. You might have heard of the term county lines, and this is where children are exploited by organised crime gangs. Um, essentially groomed to become drug runners. So they're running drugs from um, cities and towns into rural areas. And uh, but that's not the only kind of criminal exploitation. So we're also seeing things like forced begging, um, benefit fraud, um, cannabis cultiva cultivation and um, forced theft. So in all those situations, the people committing the crimes are committing the crimes because it's part of their modern slavery experience. They're being forced to do these things. And it means that in those scenarios, if, um, for example, if they've been forced to shoplift, then if they're caught shoplifting, obviously it looks like they're the person that's committing the crime. Uh, so they've got a lot of pressure on themselves to either prove that they're, that they're committing this crime as part of their modern slavery experience, or in a lot of situations, they could be so scared of their trafficker or their exploiter that they're not willing to explain to the professionals what the situation really is. Um, part of the Modern Slavery Act has got a clause that allows for, for a defence in these situations. Um, there are a lot of crimes that it doesn't cover, but they're more serious crimes, things like murder. But for situations like um, uh, theft, there is a clause in the Modern Slavery Act that allows uh, a victim of modern slavery to, to a defence based on the fact that they committed this crime as part of their modern slavery experience. Moving on then, domestic servitude is another form of exploitation, another form of modern slavery, uh, in which someone is essentially kept in a house and forced to do all the domestic work. So things like the cooking and the cleaning, sometimes raising children, um, it's very rare that victims of domestic servitude have their own living space. So they very rarely have their own bedroom. It could be that they sleep on the sofa, which means that they have to go to bed after everybody else and get up before everybody else. Um, I've worked with, with people before who've had to, they've had uh, a roll up mat in the cupboard under the stairs that they sleep on at night. Um, and these people are essentially on call 24 hours a day to do whatever uh, the exploiter wants or needs them to do. And we've got sexual exploitation, which tends to be what most people think about when we talk about modern slavery or human trafficking. And this does affect women and girls, but it also does affect boys and men as well. And it could be things like uh, on-street prostitution, um, but, but that's not the only form of sexual exploitation. It, it could be people forced to work in um, brothels or massage parlours, the pornography industry, modelling. Um, it really is, is quite broad. And then finally, organ harvesting. And this is the, the rarest form of modern slavery that's identified in the UK, but obviously is a really harrowing thing to, 
to think about um, because, well, the fact that someone's taking an organ for somebody else's benefit, and it's if it's a case of mum slavery or human trafficking, then somebody else is benefiting from the sale of that organ, most likely. And it could be a kidney, and that person could go on to live a, a normal life afterwards, but it might not necessarily always be a kidney. Okay, so an overview of the national picture. I realise this is quite a text-heavy slide, so I'll, I'll hopefully explain it quite well. Um, in the 2019, so the last full year that we've got data for, 10,627 people were identified as potential victims of modern slavery in the UK. So there's a few things to go through there. Um, so these people were identified as potential victims, and that means that they were identified and referred into the national referral mechanism. And the national referral mechanism, or NRM, is the UK system for identifying and supporting victims of one slavery in the UK. And the reason that we use the term potential victims is because once you're referred into the national referral mechanism, there's a two tier decision making process to identify whether you actually fit all the criteria to be defined as a victim of one slavery or human trafficking. So while those 10,627 people were referred into the system, it might be that once the decisions have been made, that not all of them meet that criteria. Um, but it can take a long time for those decisions to be made. So uh, the statistics that are often used are, are those of the people referred into the system rather than once we've actually got the decisions made at the end. Um, but obviously this only refers to the number of people who have actually been identified. And for adults, so people over 18 or 18 or over, uh, they have to consent to being referred into the national referral mechanism. So there will be people that have been identified that have not consented, and obviously there will be people who haven't been identified. Um, but the 10,627 is, is the best figure we've got that isn't based on estimates. So of those potential victims identified by the national referral mechanism, to give you an idea of, of um, adult and children breakdown, 55% of them were adults, and 43% of them were children, so under 18, and 2% didn't have their age recorded or their age wasn't known at the time. Um, for me, this is really quite a shocking statistic uh, because when we think of all those different types of exploitation that I've just discussed, to think about a child having to suffer through those things is really awful. But then when we look at this percentage, it's, it's so close to 50-50 on adults and children being exploited I think that is quite a shocking statistic. And again, the, the male-female breakdown is really interesting. So um, of the number of people identified, 32% of them were female and 68% of them were male. I think this is another statistic that a lot of people find quite surprising. And what's been really interesting is watching those statistics year on year. So to begin with, the, um, the national referral mechanism was seeing significantly more women referred in women and, and girls than boys and men. And each year the balance has tipped. So each year there's been a, a proportionately higher proportion of uh, males and being reported into the NRM uh, to the point where the balance tipped a few years ago. And now we're seeing significantly more men being identified, more males than females. Um, so there was one transgender person referred into the National Referral Mechanism in 2019 and 11 uh, people didn't have their gender recorded during the referral me mechanism process. So that's why we don't have those final figures. So another thing that is really interesting to show is the difference in nationalities of people referred into the national referral mechanism. So again, this refers to potential victims. So the people that have been identified and referred into the national referral mechanism in 2019. And you can see here that the U UK nationals are significantly um, the highest proportion of people referred into the national referral mechanism and uh, that's been the case for the past few years now but before that UK nationals were, were quite low so this could be a reflection of different types of crimes different types of exploitation and we're certainly seeing more cases of county lines occurring and that is common with um, uh, UK national children. 
we do see different types of exploitation for different nationalities as well. So um, Albanian females we tend to see in um, sexual exploitation and males we tend to see in labour or criminal exploitation. And Vietnamese nationals, we tend to see males in uh, criminal exploitation. So this slide gives a, an overview of the different types of exploitation and how common they were in 2019. Uh, we focus here on quarters one to three, because in quarter four, there was a change in the way that the, the crimes were reported. So um, previously in quarters one to three, criminal exploitation was part of labour exploitation, and that changed in quarter four. So um, I've just used quarter one to three here because it's really difficult to merge all of those statistics together. But you can see significantly labour exploitation is the most common form of exploitation that's been identified in the UK in 2019. So 65% um, of people referred to the National Referral Mechanism in 2019 had experienced labour exploitation. Um, but as I mentioned, criminal exploitation at this point fitted within that definition of labour exploitation. So when we're talking about the labour exploitation here, it is things like um, um, working in the agriculture industry, uh, being exploited and being exploited in food processing or packing, etc. But also things like criminal exploitation, so uh, forced um, begging, theft, benefit fraud, cannabis cultivation, county lines. Um, and as we move around, we see sexual exploitation at 23%. Um, then at the other side, we've got domestic servitude at 6%. Organ harvesting is at 0%. There were some cases, but it was so low that it didn't make up 1%. So I'm going to pass on to Andrew now to talk a bit about the Hunter Bond Slavery Partnership and give you more in-depth discussion of what's happening in our local region. Lovely. Thank you, Alicia. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm sure many of you would do, will think, uh, would have thought some of those facts were quite interesting. Excuse me for coughing. Uh, some quite interesting facts there and some quite shocking figures as well. Um, so I hope that's been useful so far. So in Humberside, our <laughs> response, as I mentioned earlier, is across the full um, full Humberside Police Force area. So that covers the four local authorities, like Alicia mentioned, Hull, East Riding, North Lincolnshire and North East Lincolnshire. And essentially what we are is a strategic network of agencies. And our aim is to tackle modern slavery and human trafficking by prosecuting the perpetrators. So the organised crime groups, uh, the small individual um, exploiters, um, and to support victims in or out of the NRM. And that's very important to mention. And as Alicia alluded to, the NRM figures for the UK uh, in 2019, those are the ones that we know of. There are many people that don't consent, uh, many people that aren't entered into the NRM, and there are many people, obviously, in fact, that we don't know about. So the numbers are, huge uh, across the UK and the potential for people in Humberside to be affected by um, some form of exploitation that we don't know about is huge. So what we're trying to do is to generate our, our, our response in a coordinated way uh, with Humberside being quite a large area we have um, we have different issues in different areas as I'm sure you'll appreciate and my job as coordinator is to bring those uh, agencies together uh, to work to ensure that we have the best response. Um, I would go as far as saying even just getting non-statutory and statutory agencies to work together can be an interesting part of the job sometimes, um, but it really does build on making our response really, really robust. A uh, victim-focused approach is hugely important. Um, so we can see uh, improved identification and support for victims um, and as well as improved knowledge amongst the public and professionals and we still have a long way to go uh, across the country in raising awareness of modern slavery, of uh, raising awareness of the different types of exploitation 
and actually who's affected because sometimes I think people are quite surprised um, the the vast array of the different people that are affected from exploitation and modern slavery um, and we want to make Humberside a hostile environment for traffickers and I always wonder about this one because sometimes I ask myself well if we make Humberside a hostile environment for traffickers are we just pushing the problem somewhere else so as a partnership we're very mindful of that that actually um, we work with partners um, regionally and nationally as well to make sure that we all benefit from this partnership work. I'm very cro cro croaky today, sorry. Um, so the local picture in Humberside, slight difference from the national picture that Alicia has just spoken about in that um, we have a high proportion of criminal exploitation in Humberside. And that's purely down to the issue of county lines exploitation of uh, predominantly young people. That is a large issue in Humberside. Um, we're quite a big importer in Humberside of uh, county lines crime. So those county lines coming from Manchester, Liverpool, et cetera, do affect Humberside. Uh, we had 48 adults and 46 children referred into the NRM in 2019. So kind of a almost similar split to the UK picture, I guess, in the number of adults and children that are referred in. Um, the second biggest type was um, exploitation outside of the UK, followed by forced labour and then followed up by domestic servitude and um, sexual exploitation and trafficking. So quite an interesting picture for Humberside. And the local picture regards nationalities, again, kind of mirrors the UK as a whole. Uh, British people are the highest proportion of people that have been referred into the national referral mechanism. Uh, we've seen that consistently for the last couple of years, and I don't think 2020 will be vastly different. Um, I think we can go to the next slide for, for that, Alicia, as well, unless you want to add anything to that. Um, so we wanted to talk about COVID-19 and modern slavery. Obviously, it's quite topical, um, and I think it's quite important to discuss actually the um, the effect global pandemics and national crises can have on how we support vulnerable people in our communities. And COVID-19 has been no different, and that has really affected how we respond to modern slavery. Um, in Humberside, but in the UK as well. So a lot of our first responder organisations, um, people that provide um, support under the, the UK's contract to support victims, third sector organisations, um, and even statutory organisations are obviously have been under a great amount of strain um, since March. And those reduced services, those furloughed staff, um, especially in our area, lots of closed drop-in centres, means that actually that access for victims and, and, and us as support workers accessing those victims has been really, really tricky. And that's difficult because interaction and access to vulnerable people is difficult at the best of times, but you couple that with a global pandemic and effectively a, almost a national shutdown, a lot of vulnerable people people become very, very isolated, uh, very withdrawn, um, and the support network completely drops away. So I know a lot of you will know about um, our statutory response to homelessness um, in, in response to COVID-19, and local authorities around the country have made use of um, many hotels and bed and breakfasts to accommodate homeless people. So that could be rough sleepers, that could be um, transient people, that could be people fleeing domestic abuse, uh, coming out of prison, etc., that have nowhere to live. We know that exploiters have been visiting those hotels um, that are used to house homeless people to collect money from their victims. Um, our exploiters are indebting these victims um, through illegal money lending and then forcing them um, forcing them to work with them or to repay that money, um, even to the point of taking victims to cash points and forcing them to withdraw money um, and taking the bank cards, etc. So quite ruthless tactics used. 
even in the midst of um, even in the midst of a national crisis, these tactics are, are very aggressive, very ruthless. Uh, and for somebody who is is very vulnerable, um, maybe doesn't speak the local language, um, could maybe have learning difficulties, that kind of thing. Their support network. This is absolutely terrifying for people on a daily basis. Next slide, Alicia, please. There we go. Um, so again, as I, I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, um, county lines is a huge issue across the UK, and um, it is in Humberside as well. Uh, and criminals, gangs, there's organised um, organised crime groups that use young people to sell drugs. Um, have during lockdown a, a lot more access to young people, unfortunately. Um, to be able to exploit them in to county lines, um, gangs and movement of drugs. Um, and as the restrictions are lifted, um, these organised crime groups are going to be looking to import more drugs, drugs back into the UK. And um, what we have seen over the last few months since March is that because the availability of drugs has decreased, um, Criminal gangs have been trying to find alternative methods of keeping production high, and that quite often means the quality of drugs is reducing. Um, lots of unique cutting agents have been used to cut these drugs to keep the sales high, um, and that's had a really dire effect on people's health. Um, it's, it's really, really dangerous. Um, so they will be looking to replenish those drugs, and they will be looking to continue to recruit more young people to facilitate that movement. Um, uh, one big thing we have seen nationally is uh, victims being moved to other roles or other types of exploitation um, during lockdown. So many people that were exploited um, in one form of exploitation, if that has been closed or has been affected by lockdown, um, those victims have been moved into more in-demand um, places of exploitation, for example, food production and agriculture, uh, two of the highest identified areas of the labour market that have seen an increase in exploited workers. And because our national demand has increased exponentially over the last six months, um, exploiters, again, are using that as an opportunity uh, to fill those roles with exploited workers. And then our vulnerable, uh, isolated and elderly, infirm or young people with learning difficulties are significantly higher at risk of becoming victims of cuckooing uh, because of the reduction of community support. So that cuckooing, that taking over of a vulnerable person's house, either um, to use as a base for dealing drugs or growing of drugs or other criminal activity, it's so much easier to do that when these vulnerable at-risk people aren't being visited by support workers on a regular basis like they were and quite often just a phone call once a week it is has not been um not been sufficient to keep the these people out of harm's way so we are seeing an increase of um of this cuckoo in which is, is will be really difficult to come back from i think I think that about wraps it up. I think we've got about eight or nine minutes left. Um, if anybody does have concerns around um, any type of exploitation or anything that doesn't look quite right, um, if someone's in immediate danger, you can call 999. We have the Modern Slavery Helpline in the UK. Uh, the Modern Slavery Helpline is very, very accessible for anybody. Uh, the website's there on the screen. You can visit that. You can um, learn more about the different types of exploitation. You can report concern directly to the Modern Slavery Helpline, who will then forward that concern onto your local police force. They also have a telephone number and they also have an app, which you can find all the details from on the website as well. And you can also con uh, contact Crime Stoppers, uh, which have uh, a dedicated Modern Slavery page on their website as well. And for more information locally, you can visit our website, which is uh, humberantislave.com, our Twitter, humberantislave, and you can email myself or Alicia um, at the email addresses given on the screen. And I think that should just about cover it. So if we hand back to Nick and see if he's got any burning questions for us.
Yeah, thank you very much, for, uh, Alicia and Andrew. That's fantastic and uh, interesting. I, I always learn something every time I listen to you both, and I can't remember cuckooing before. <laughs> so I, I, uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting to hear how the terminology changes. Um, obviously, modern slavery is one of these things that, for most people, members of the public, has has really been a quite recent phenomena. Um, how bad is it? How bad is our response in the uh, Humber area to the modern slavery? Have we are we at the forefront of fighting uh, slavery, um, or you know, is, is there anything uh, unique about the way we've responded to the challenge of anti-slavery? Uh, yeah, I think it, I, I suppose I would answer in two parts there. I think the first part would be that modern slavery is so much more widespread than we would ever think, and and anybody would ever think, and you know, it, it's such a it's such a hidden crime and such a dastardly crime that um, exploiters and organised crime groups will do anything and they will take any measures to to um, to hide that activity and and to to keep hold of their property and, and uh, which is the victims they're exploiting. So our response has to be excellent. And unfortunately in the UK, we've we've been slow to respond to, to modern slavery, unfortunately. Humberside, we started, the partnership started back in 2015. Um, and it's been a long journey, I think. It's it's it, it's always been a collective of concerned professionals that have noticed this type of um, criminal activity occurring with the people that they work with, and really wanted to do something about it. And we're in a fortunate position now, where our police and crime commissioner has has funded my role for three years. Um, Humberside Police have a dedicated modern slavery team uh, just to tackle this very subject. So I think actually we are in a really good place, but for me personally, I, Alicia might have a, another another take on it. But I think for me, we still need that awareness and we still need that understanding from our communities and the general public. It it's still not understood enough, and and it still shocks people when we talk about the subject and they kind of don't expect it to be so prevalent and, and exist so much still now. So I think if we can, I think if we can really work hard in the next year or two to, to raise that uh, profile of, of modern slavery and raise the profile of actually who it affects, I, I think we will be doing those victims justice. I don't know if, if you would add anything to that, Alicia. For, for me, there's definitely been an increase in um, the standard of partnership working uh, in our area over the, the past few years. Um, but one thing that we do rely on uh, is information. Um, because a lot of situations of, of modern slavery, um, we wouldn't come across unless someone identifies it and reports it. We have seen, again, a huge increase in the amount of intelligence and information being reported to professionals, to the police, to the local authorities, to safeguarding, to crime stoppers over the past few years. And that directly has impacted the number of referrals that we've been making. So um, when we first started the partnership, we could count the number of referrals on our fingers. Whereas now you saw the, the figures um, that Andrew talked through with um, the 48 adults and 46 children in 2019. So we have seen a vast increase, um, but obviously that's only the people that we're referring in. And it doesn't actually say anything about the standard of care that they're receiving. Um, but I think we can say with confidence that um, the increase in knowledge that professionals have received over the past few years has filtered down to lead to your better response to those victims and survivors and a better um, long-term support as well because there was this this risk of a cliff edge before where people get support for a, for a while and then um, the support kind of ends and that's something that's changed over the past couple of years where that that long-term support is now available um, but that really does rely on partnership working because if you think of, we've got over 60 organisations that are part of this Humber One Slavery Partnership, and we do rely so much on this working in partnership, because especially if someone's identified in one local authority area and they need housing, 
we ideally don't want to house them in the same local authority area as the place that they were exploited. So that relies on um, partnership working between the different local authority areas, as well as including housing or the NGOs that might be able to support with housing, sorry, non-governmental organisations or charities, that might be able to support with housing and other support needs, so providing food or um, counselling or clothing, that kind of thing. Um, so the response has definitely improved, but obviously there's never, there's never ending to how much we can improve. We can certainly do more. Um, but I think we've also got to consider that modern slavery is one of a huge list of safeguarding issues that professionals have to, to deal with. So while modern slavery is our particular interest and, and we want to push this agenda and we want to make sure that there is a lot of knowledge and there's a lot of learning and a lot of training around it to, to improve prevention, understanding and victim response. So, so we ensure that victims and survivors get the best possible care. Um, there is only one of a myriad of things that professionals have to deal with. So they might be also looking at domestic violence, um, child abuse, uh, and, and so many other things that but we have to be aware that their time isn't just fully de dedicated to this. And that's why things like the Modern Slavery Partnerships are so valuable because um, it kind of shares that burden between all the different organisations that are involved. Thank you. Um... I think what kind of training do frontline staff uh, receive on modern slavery and is this all coordinated by the modern slavery partnership that you mentioned yeah it's um, again training itself has, has come a long way over the last uh, few years as well um, so we we try our best as a, as a partnership to um, to coordinate that that training effort across the area to make sure it's consistent and, and again, we do that in partnership with our partner agencies. Um, some agencies are, are further ahead than others. Some have dedicated in-house training available to, to, to new starters, say. So for one example could be the National Probation Service has uh, an element of modern slavery in its uh, new starter training, which is fantastic. Um, again, it's, a, it's just about us being able to facilitate the sharing of that training um the the updating of that training because as you know things rapidly change in this sector um and making sure everybody's is confident in in their abilities to spot the signs but also to report as Alyssa said uh, amongst the other hundred things they're doing on a on a weekly basis yeah no, the, um the project that uh, Andrew's helping me on at the moment um, with a number of other partners is uh, developing some quite unique training on modern slavery um, and it, this is aimed specifically at modern slavery partnerships but instead of it being uh, standing at the front of the room and talking at people for three hours it's um, it's based on scenarios of modern slavery and instead of trying to encourage awareness, it's trying to look at best response. So um, it will involve a, a group of people who are attending the training working together through a scenario. So they're provided with this situation. They have to decide what it means, who would respond, who would take the lead, who would pay for it, what issues they might come across, which legislation they can involve. Um, if things don't go to plan the first time because we like to throw some spanners in the works as, a, as the scenario progresses, then um, is there any other legislation that they could rely on to be able to support this person? And then also being really honest and realistic about what support they would actually, their organisation would actually be able to offer, uh, how long it would take to give a response. Because while we all would love to know that we can respond within an hour and we'll be able to provide 30 members of staff, if that's not realistic, we need to know. So that if this situation does occur in our area, we know physically what the possible response could be um, and we can plug any gaps ahead of it actually happening. So we're working on developing all these scenarios at the moment for a number of different, specifically aimed at different partners within the partnerships. And this will be going out um, in September. Uh, we're really looking forward to that. We've run, run a few of them at the Humber Modern Slavery Partnership with our partners, and they've been really interesting. And I think what's really valuable for me is that that type of learning, everybody learns from everybody. 
So on the topics of modern slavery, while um, I've got academic understanding and Andrew's got his understanding of working as the coordinator of the partnership, each person who's attending is an expert in their own right and they will have understood modern slavery from a different perspective depending on what their role is. So this kind of learning brings everyone together to be able to speak about how they have dealt with modern slavery, what their understanding of it is, where our gaps are, um, so that we can then learn from that learning experience as well and set actions within the partnerships to be able to um, deal with any issues, share best practice or plug any gaps before we actually come across these, these potential situations in real life. Okay. It's very exciting to hear about how the training is evolving, so it's a good luck with that one. Um, the, uh, I wonder if you could explain a little bit more about what are some of the issues faced by people who are actively involved in dealing with um, situations of modern slavery. You know, is, it, is, it a, is, is that also a changing situation or is it just increasingly dangerous? Um, it can be dangerous depending on on what organisation you work for. So if we take uh, our enforcement agencies such as police, um, National Crime Agency, um, Border Force, uh, Food Standards Agency, even the National Food Crimes Unit, um, there are potential hostilities. Um, it, it can be quite risky, obviously, when trying to tackle organised crime groups. Um, I, but then I think on the other side, for, for people who support victims as well, um, that's quite a unique response when we look at um, how support providers use trauma-informed care and trauma-informed care initiatives to actually just understand what these victim, what the victims might have potentially gone through and actually how deep-rooted that trauma is within them. Um, you could come across easily victims that have been exploited and trafficked and abused for uh, multiple years, um, all the while feeling they were never going to escape, um that there was no hope um and that's really difficult to do with someone on on that deep traumatic level and it it, it can be a burden on support workers um so it, um that emotional burnout is a real risk for people so our support providers need to understand um the effects these types of of, of criminality can have on people um and that's part of our work is to make sure we are well versed in what response is needed, but actually how effective our response is and how long lasting it is for these um, for these adults and, and these children that have been severely traumatized that they don't end up being re-trafficked uh, uh, and re-exploited and that they have sufficient support networks, that they have a bright future, that they have every opportunity of all, of all afforded to them that, that, that the rest of us should have um, uh, and I think with with modern slavery it's just that little bit more tricky and it's just that little bit more difficult and we just have to be um, ever so slightly more sensitive to, to the needs of, of the people we're trying to um, rescue or support. Yeah, I mean, Sorry. Sorry, I, I was going to say that Andrew has a much better knowledge about the, the actual um, frontline response than I do and often works with those frontline responders to assist victims and uh, support survivors. Um, but as Andrew said, well, like we've been talking about in, the, in this talk, um, there's so many different types of exploitation that someone could experience that each situation is so very different that you really have to be able to respond to each situation in modern slavery on its own merit um, so that there is no blanket response of how you can deal with a situation in modern slavery because dealing with um, a 12 year old UK national who's been trafficked across the country to deal drugs is going to be exponentially different to um, someone who has fled a conflict zone to the UK um, doesn't have recourse to public funds and is a an adult male trying to help his family survive. Um, that there there is so much pressure to be able to understand so many different pieces of legislation, and but also 
be able to respond in a respectful way to each different person to be able to understand what they've been through and, and respond suitably. Um, so every every situation is so very different. Um, you mentioned that obviously lots of uh, res the res response of the Humber Modern Slavery Partnership and also the statutory role of the Humberside Police, but what can members of the public do to try and help uh, this crusade against modern forms of slavery and human rights violations in our region. Is there anything that they can do? Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, something I always try to sort of leave till the end as a, as a takeaway, I suppose, is um, for me, we, we have to be good at responding to modern slavery. We have to be good at disrupting organised crime and protecting victims. But actually, we need to be more forward thinking than that. We need to build resilient communities that are immune to this type of criminality in the first place. Uh, and the only way we can build resilient communities is by everybody in that community coming together with that shared goal to say, no, this is not acceptable. Um, we will not tolerate this. So the big thing for me is um, being able to spot the signs, being able to understand that there's a potential that a, a particular family on your street or somebody you work with might be being exploited. Um, if we can use those tools as a community and then we can use these tools of reporting and um, raising concerns, I think we will start, or we have the potential to start building a more resilient community. Um, a quick example could be um, a, a terraced house on a street has lots of rubbish outside on a weekly basis and there are lots of people coming and going more than you would expect for that size of house. Um, that could be indicative of um, something that's not quite right. So it could be something untoward, uh, it could be something criminal. It also could be um, a house that's used to accommodate lots of victims of labour exploitation, for example. You know, they might never open the curtains, all these kind of signs. So I think if we can really raise that awareness with, with, with the public and with our communities and actually give them the confidence to um, report concerns and know that it is being taken seriously, hopefully, we, hopefully organised crime groups will see that they're not going to profit here, they're not going to find those victims here and um, we we will do something about it. That That's what I would like to see, that would be my dream um, outcome I suppose. Thank you. Yeah, just to add, um, I think it's as important for members of the public to know what to look out for as it is for members of the public to know what they are entitled to. Um, so it is really important that um, people have got concerns, they know where to go, um, and that you can contact organisations like the Modern Slavery Helpline if you're concerned, but don't even not even sure what it is, but they will be able to give you advice, um, more information about what to look for, uh, where else you might go for more information. But equally, if, if you're um, a worker in the UK and you don't know what the minimum wage is, or you don't know that you're entitled to holiday pay, or you don't know that you're entitled to sick pay, that's a really easy thing that we can change. Like Everyone should know what they're entitled to when they're working. Um, so as well as raising awareness about what modern slavery is and signs to look out for, we need to raise awareness as to what the standards are that should be expected in the UK. If you're not earning the minimum wage, then you're allowed to question that, you're allowed to do something about it. Um, so we need to take responsibility of that for ourselves as well and making sure that we are working and getting what we are entitled to. Thank you. And so, uh, hopefully if you're listening to this recording, uh, you have uh, gathered it's a recorded lecture or a recorded webinar rather than a live discussion. And so on behalf of you with the audience, I'd like to thank Andrew and Alicia for that fantastic uh, series of questions and answers, but also the uh, fantastic presentation full stop, and more importantly about the brilliant work they're doing in trying to fight this uh, uh, blight of modern society, this form of contemporary slavery that they've been discussing. If you are listening and you'd like to ask a question, 
then there'll be a live Q&A uh, uh, chat if you've got any questions on, on the Humber Modern Slavery Partnerships Twitter feed. And so if you can see on the screen, that's Humber Anti-Slave if you're on Twitter. And they'll be fielding questions between five o'clock and six o'clock on Sunday the 6th of September during the Freedom Festival. And if you're listening to this recorded uh, webinar afterwards, then please get in touch with either of them through Twitter, through the website, or through the uh, email here. But on behalf of the World Force Institute at the University of Hull, we'd like to thank everybody um, uh, for joining us with this webinar today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.